I've always danced. I, I remember my first dance class at three years old, but I've always had dance in my life, so it's, it's always just been a real important part of me and who I am. My mother was a dancer, and she danced when she was pregnant with me, so I think that movement has been a part of my life literally from the beginning. My first class ever was flamenco when I was three. My father was a Spanish guitar player and played flamenco, so my mother and I went and took a little flamenco class and I had castanets and a red cape. My mom would always dress me up and I always wanted to dance. I was one of those little girls that everybody put on top of the tables and on top of the, you know, dressers. Well, I've been dancing most of my life and uh, as many dancers have. I just found myself sort of weaving in and out of different dance genres, spending most of my time, I would say, with the ballroom dance. I saw this flyer on the window that said, salsa classes. And I went, salsa? I can do that. So um, I signed up with a buddy of mine. But then the next week they switched it on me, and it went from salsa to tango. And I was like, tango? Oh, that's that stupid dance where they wear the flower in their mouth and, you know, oh, I don't know about that. One day I went to see Forever Tango, the Broadway show Forever Tango, and I was just so inspired and I really, I couldn't believe it. I, I just never saw a dance like that that I've taken by and I just really wanted to do it. So I was there by myself and took the class, found it fascinating because in, immediately I realized that there's... Um, it's not like other, I immediately knew it was not like other dances. And I just, I said, that one is, that one's the one for me. That's, that's the dance that I want to do. And Debbie Goodwin called me and she had this vision about a group of women coming together to work together in a collaborative effort of choreography and dance and mixing together not only the tango, but different dance backgrounds. What I wanted in the women that I worked was going to be choosing to work with was that they had a strong background in dance, not just Argentine tango, but preferred to have um, other kind of modern or classical ballet or jazz, some other type of dance form, because I, my vision was to, to mix these forms with Argentine tango, so it wouldn't be just Argentine tango, but rather a fusion of these genres. I thought she was insane. I thought, why would I be in this group, especially when she started naming the people she wanted to be in the group i.e. Chelsea and, and Christy and Pierre. And I went, I'm not in that league. These women are amazing. Why would you want me to dance with them? Tango Mohair has been around for a few years and they've done a number of performances and gotten great um, uh, reviews and uh, been quite successful in doing what they do. And so I started thinking about this group, about women. I had been thinking about it for a few years. I wanted them to be women who who had this background, but were independent, strong women. They needed to both lead and follow tango. There was leeway in that with my choices. And it was really amazing to me because Debbie said, okay, we're gonna do this group private with uh, one of the founding ladies from Tango Mujer. And I thought, that's cool. So this workshop sort of just threw us all together. It was very helpful for the first meeting when we got together to have Brigitte Winkler from Tango Mujer. Um, we just had two hours with her that just kind of get us started. When Brigitte came and did the workshop, she presented lots of games for us to play, and we invented our own games. And, and so we just played with, without being serious about making a piece right away, we just played with all these games and concepts. We did this group lesson, and that was the start. It was um, kind of, we just, at that point, we said, okay, let's see what we can do. Let's give it a try. Let's meet. We met, and that first uh, rehearsal was, was a month after the initial meeting with Brigitte, almost a month after, I think it was, at my house, my home studio. And we just clicked. But the, the funny thing is that we were all women who were overcommitted, as it was. These are busy women. They're not supposed to be have the time to like make these gigs and performance um, dates and stuff. And I was thinking, well, nothing will really happen. We'll just sort of get together once a week and, and, and I learn how to lead. And so we, we came together with enthusiasm and reluctance both, <laughs> thinking, is this something we really want to add to our schedules or not? And uh, 
and yet, you know, we wanted to try it out. And the fact that they wanted to continue playing and, and working with an all-women group was interesting to me, but I really thought it was a very casual, fool-around, fool-around experience. I had no idea that we would have gigs and performance responsibilities and, and the whole thing where it would become this big, big deal for all of us. Our creative process is collaborative. There's input from all members of the group. We don't have a director. The energy is wonderful when we work together. What, what's nice about, you know, the strength is strength is not just being aggressive and, and being the only one who has to be in charge, but it's, it's having a quality about you that you can, that you will listen and, and you will respond to what other people have to say and consider things. And so these qualities work really well when we're working together. What we've done is given ourselves the assignment that each person is to come in with a movement idea and we'll spend a certain amount of time exploring that one idea. You know, somebody will throw something out and we'll, we'll play along those lines for a given period of time and see what we come up with. Out of just playing, choreography would come. And then there was the other side where it was actual working out steps. And that could be done individually, like let's say Christy and Chelsea get together and come up with something, or Pierre and Debbie got together and, and come up, came up with something, and then they brought it to the table. The cool thing is that we're all um, uh, well-trained dancers. We have all this background and everything, and all of the, the movements and everything are just there. There's, like, we have this vocabulary waiting to use, you know, so we can make make our sentences from this vocabulary at a moment's notice, really. Oftentimes someone will have, be stronger in a certain area. Well, for instance, uh, Christy knows choreography. She knows steps very well. So she's able to know how to get from one direction to another very easily. Debbie understands lead extremely well. Debbie, I think, is just an amazing, she's like one of my favorite leaders <laughs> as partners, you know, male, female, doesn't matter. Debbie's a great leader. And um, Chelsea, she knows her body and she knows what looks aesthetically pleasing. Pierre has lines because of all her modern dance training. Her, her lines are very good, so she knows how to stretch a movement out. And me, I can put a punch in things. I can put a dynamic in something that maybe not, wasn't there before. So I add a little, an extra gancho or something, to, you know, so each of us, we might have a step, but then someone will bring something from their strength into it and change it or help it to evolve to make it um, what becomes our dance. Costumes are tricky, especially when you have five women who are, you know, extremely well put together and, and are very conscious of, of looking good and, and, and I'm the schlub of the group. We each have our features that we'd like to play up or play down. So we've tried to be really sensitive to that in our costume selection. And sometimes we laugh because we get together and, you know, we spend like half an hour like figuring out what we're going to wear and how we're going to, and then we say, oh, you know, probably we should choreograph the dance now. <laughs> Debbie is a shopaholic and she can run around and she would buy all these costume possibilities, bring them in, we all try things on, and then she'd take them back and return them to the store if they didn't work. And at one point we all, they all like this mint green dress but we all couldn't be mint green. And Pierre kept looking and saying, oh, this just isn't working. And one day she said, okay. She said, give me till tomorrow or something. And it, like overnight she came with these drawings and pieces of cloth all dyed to different colors and a whole schematic thing all drawn out, these beautiful costumes. And we were just blown away and we just said, that's fabulous. You know, it's like we had a costume designer amongst us, but she didn't want to come out. <laughs> she wanted to hide that part of it. You know, the, the critics' reviews, best thing they've said about our dance so far is our costume, so there you go. The 
music really inspires the dance, and we've been very fortunate to be able to work with some great music. The genre of tango music is vast, it's, it's huge. Argentine tango music generally evokes this kind of um, emotion ranging from passion and drama and conflict. And it's, people say that Argentine tango is the music and the dance is a reflection of life. Usually choreographies come forward that are reflective of the mood of the music at that moment in the song. The first thing we do is we, we listen and we understand the music better, we listen to it over and over again, and we start to kind of see how the music is formed, it's different moods that are created and what we feel in the music, and then from that we try to create the dance. For the solo piece, we were able to have one of the pieces that uh, Matt Montgomery actually composed, and then his sister Vanessa Montgomery, she played the violin for us, so that song is just such a fabulous song. It's just, it just goes deep into the soul. When I first heard the music, I thought, oh God, okay, contain yourself, Michelle. When music is intense, I tend to get very intense. And when I heard the piece, I just thought, oh, I'm not going to be able to control myself. Because I really thought it was just so dynamic and just so strong. And, and it would get soft and it get hard again and, and the music, you know, really frenetic violin and, you know, it was fascinating. But I, I didn't know if I'd be able to dance to it. And I was able to actually, I think it's absolutely wonderful music. It's almost like a movie score. You listen to it and you can see all kinds of things happening to it, but not necessarily tango dance steps. It's like this amazing, rich music with all kinds of emotional sounds happening. It's very daunting to have to choreograph to. But the women are fearless <laughs> and um, drawn to it because it's so rich and, and unpredictable. It's something, though, we need to um, resonate to. That, that it, it wants us to create. You want to move to it. And so somebody has to be interested in being able to move to it, create to it, to get ideas from. So it needs to be inspirational. One of the things I love most about working with this group of women, about the exchange of lead and follow. I love to lead and I love to follow. I love the aspect of trust and surrender that goes along with following. And the great thing about working with this group of women is that we all explore both roles. I guess I'd have to say that if I had to choose one, I still would rather follow, because I just enjoy sort of the, the relaxing mode of being a follower. You get to just really be in the moment and you know just be right in there with the music and, and, and relax, and it's sort of meditative for me. In a sense, it's sometimes easier for me to lead, because being a follower, it, it can be very difficult. You have to just let go. You have to completely let go and let somebody else be in charge. I'm going to learn how to lead and totally get frustrated and say, this is not, I can't deal with this. It's not, I, I don't understand it. It's so different. I have no command over it. For me, it's um, a whole other dance on the other side. Leading is a challenge because just of my size. But when I'm teaching, and when I'm dancing with women my size, I'm, I'm fully in control and I'm able to improvise and be confident. As a leader, you're the one who is initiating the conversation, also making some choices about how you want to interpret the, the music as the one who's proposing something. It's a role, I think, in which you feel you feel strong and protective at the same time. You're the one who's holding with that right arm and holding and guiding and making the follower feel safe, ideally, in your arms. I find when I'm leading that I'm not quite as meditative. It's more of a, a challenge. It's more like think a thinking process. and It's like you're going to the floor and there's a blank canvas and now you have to create something. So it involves all of your senses to try to pull it together, listen to the music, be sensitive to the person that you're leading and create this dance. So it's, it's a lot of stuff going on. You have to be much more aware. You can't sort of just tune out.
As a leader, you're stuck with yourself. As a follower, you get to experience all these different worlds with every, every leader. As a leader, you're stuck with your own dance forever and ever. And you can bore yourself no end. Here's the thing. It's because doing the leader's role is not my comfort zone, it's empowering to do it. When, when, when a leader presents an idea or an invitation to make a step, the follower may not take it exactly the way you think they're going to take it. So as a leader, you have to be able to accommodate what that follower does and go where that follower does, and especially when you're beginning. You may, may think you're leading one thing, but the follower takes it as a totally different sentence or conversation and you go, oh, well, I have to follow her through space. I don't want her, I don't want to trip her up. I don't want to knock her over. I don't want to make her feel bad. So I, I, I have to sort of give up my, my little bit of, you know, command of it and just follow and then try again. But I think a real lead and follow is constantly having that give and take of, of communication. And, and actually feeling what a follower feels like in your arms, the variety of it is, is huge. I enjoy this so much, working with these other women, and then I want people to see that. I'd like people to want to be out there with us. For me, it's uh, very passionate about tango. It's a really important element of my life, and um, I wouldn't live without it. You know? We're showing that you don't have to put boundaries on your pleasure or boundaries on on what you see as beautiful you know or pleasing because i know when people watch us heterosexual homosexual bisexual when they watch us, they think wow that's beautiful and that's all that matters I, I would not i wouldn't know these women as well if, if it wasn't for this group and i really like them they are just really giving and really strong and um, can be friends, and it's just, it's amazing. I, I didn't think there were women like that out there. What does your friendship mean to me? Um, it means a lot because um, hmm. they're taking the time to know me beyond, you know, who I present on a day to day. And it's very nice that people care to like find out. And same for me on the other side. So I would hope that Tango Confucian would inspire other women to speak up, to create, to express themselves out loud. If you're passionate about something that you should that you should live it. And, um, and not take for granted that you have that interest or passion, that this might be the most important thing in your life. And no matter what, above all else, you should make that a priority and make it happen for you.